So everyone, thanks very much to all of you for coming together this morning and spending a few minutes just um, just listening to me. I I must say that um, I can share in what a fascinating journey it is to be a descendant of a person of of Indian origin. Almost a hundred years ago, my grandfather and two of his friends left their village in Surat and worked in Bombay for a bit to get onto a boat, got off in Mauritius, worked there for seven years, built up some money to get the fare to Cape Town and then came to, to Cape Town. His two friends when they could afford it, sent for wives from India. He sold fruit and vegetables and married the daughter of the farmer, um, a Dutch woman, um, who renounced not only her religion but also her race and said that she was going to take, renounce the privileges that were due to whites <coughs> under segregation and under apartheid and ended up being able to make some of the best Indian dishes, whether it is of the vegetarian variety or of um, even the North Indian cuisine um, and so forth. My father in turn married. My mother was kind of fourth generation Malay because 300 years ago the Dutch had taken slaves and political exiles from places like Java, South India, and others and brought them into the Cape and created this overarching identity of Cape Malays. <coughs> and so I'm very fortunate that I have the best of many worlds. Um, and so I may have all the best of Indian features. I have not been encumbered by the relatively small size of the Malays. Um, and there are some Dutch genes that has given me some elasticity. Um, so, so that really is the fascinating personal journey. Um, very interestingly, the one friend who came with him, Chacha Valley, his son became one of the biggest pharmaceutical um, industrial leaders. When Nelson Mandela became <coughs> president in 1994. My father's friend, his other friend, Chacha Omar, his son became South Africa's first minister of justice. Oh. And my grandfather's grandson, myself, became the minister of health and later the governor of, or the premier of the Western Cape. So those three friends can really rest in their graves knowing that not only has South Africa been good to them, they have also been good to South Africa. And I think that that really is the story of a diaspora. How does it manage to live with multiple identities? And so the lesson that we've learned is that it is possible to be South African. It is possible to be a South African Muslim or a South African Hindu. And it certainly is possible to be a South African Muslim of Indian origin. And when you don't choose between identities, and you in fact integrate identities, you have a marvelously rich life that gives you access to all kinds of cuisine, all kinds of culture. You draw on the national resources of the nation you belong to, and you are able to practice in peace the kind of religious and faith edicts that comes from your particular um, religion. And in turn, when the country sees that you are not disparaging the national aspirations to be South African, it in turn acts in facilitative ways so that your other identities are respected. And that, I think, is the wonderful journey 
that we have had under Nelson Mandela. I think secondly, we always joke, um, a few years ago when I was governor of the Western Cape, I had the great pleasure of hosting Sonia Gandhi um, in Cape Town. And in introducing her, I joked with her. I said that a hundred years ago, India sent a lawyer over to South Africa, and South Africa returned the Mahatma. <laughs> um, because it was really in South Africa mm -hmm. that Mahatma Gandhi found a laboratory for Satyagraha, when firstly he saw the extent of dehumanization that not only Indians, but also black people were being subjected to. He thought he could, being the good lawyer that he was, he thought that he could stand up in any court and defend his clients because his clients were legally and morally right by international standards. When he tested those first cases in the courts in South Africa, he realized that in fact the law was the problem in South Africa because it was legal to dispossess blacks. It was legal. It may not have been moral, but it was legal to discriminate and to do terrible things to people of Indian origin, Malay origin, colored origin, and um, African origin. And then he realized the limitations of being a good lawyer. That you could be the best lawyer but in an illegal system, you will not get far. And that's when he transformed his thinking from being a good lawyer into being a good leader. That's when he became a Mahatma. And that's, we believe, where he took that spirit of <coughs> defying passively unjust laws. He brought that back to India and became the powerful motor force for India's history. And so he left behind a Congress tradition because according to the law, you could not be in the same organizations with people of other races. <coughs> and so what South Africans did was to form the African National Congress, was to form the Colored People's Congress of Colored People, was to form the Congress of Democrats for white people who wanted liberation as well and to form the South African Indian Congress. And so, in the late 1950s, all of these different racial congresses came together and formed the African National Congress. And, we, and that was formed by what we call the Three Doctors Pact. The first doctor was the president of the African National Congress, Dr. Kuma. Two other doctors, with Dr. Monty Naika from the Natal Indian Congress and Dr. Yusuf Dadu from the Transvaal Indian Congress. And that's how the African National Congress was formed. And that's the way in which the blood, sweat and tears of the Indian diaspora is written all over the history of South Africa. And the last point on that is really that we all know that Nelson Mandela spent 27 years in jail. Almost every day of that 27 years, his good friend was Ahmed Katraya. That Oliver Tambo was exiled for 30 years. Almost every day next to him was Dr. Yusuf Dadu and Dr. Naika and others. And we all know that Chief Lutuli was assassinated by the South African police. What we don't know sometimes is that an Indian person was the first one to be tortured to death and thrown out of the 10th floor window of the security branch, Ahmad Timo. And so I really think that it is a way in which relationships with our Indian community are not just strong, they are founded in the blood that was spilt for freedom, democracy, and human rights in South Africa 
and they were founded on the basis of the great impact that Mahatma Gandhi um, had made um, in South Africa and across the world. It brings us, I think, to this present moment of enormous opportunity in South Africa and on the African continent. And again, it is a tribute to the long-standing relationships between South Africa and India that India has translated its support for us during the anti-apartheid struggle into support for us even as we are now able to redevelop and reconstruct our country. And so many years ago, we formed IPSA. Firstly, the South Africa India Binational Commission, meaning that we have that relationship at the highest level. Then we formed IPSA, India, Brazil, and South Africa. Three democracies, emerging markets that wanted to work together. And then later, <coughs> we all joined together to form BRICS. We added China and Russia into the equation with India, Brazil, and South Africa. And of course, I don't think that we, on an ordinary day, describe China and Russia as model democracies or countries of great human rights. So it's far more of an economic relationship, but at its heart is this very strong human rights orientated uh, relationship called IPSA. And at its heart is this long struggle for dignity by India and South Africa. So whatever economics we're talking, we've got to understand that it is founded on something far more profound than just opening markets and closing deals. It's based on the idea that humanity can be different. It's that great Gandhian Mandela, Mandela idea that human beings are ultimately in need not only of more material wealth, but they also need great spiritual foundations, great foundations founded in the souls and in the recognition of the dignity of people. And that's the unique um, contribution of people of African and Indian origins across the world. We have more responsibilities than simply making money. And I think that wherever we go, that has to be at the core of not only what business we do, but how we do business. I can't remember the full quote, but one of the most compelling things that Mahatma Gandhi had ever said, and amongst others he said that the things that will destroy humanity is science without ethics, and knowledge without wisdom. And then he said, Business without models. And that's one of the most powerful things that any human being has said to describe the world we are living in today. We've got scientific advances, but it seems to know no ethical limits. We have knowledge in abundance, universities producing experts on everything, but often lacking wisdom what to do with that knowledge and how to apply it. And I think that we're probably generating more money in such obscene ways at the commanding echelons of the economies, but without the moral care about whether we're widening inequality, whether poverty is growing, and whether we're becoming selfish human beings, whether we are denaturing the human soul. And therefore, when I, when I think when we speak in one forum, we speak business. But when we come together in this great alliance between the South Africa of Nelson Mandela and the India of Mahatma Gandhi, I think we need to be reminding each other of the greater um, responsibilities that we carry. So how do we approach the opportunities in a country like South Africa? And how do we use South Africa as the gateway into the African economy. Because that's what we offer the world. That is why 
the BRICS countries invited South Africa into BRICS, not because, because we can't compete with India or China on population. They have over a billion people, we've only got 55 million. We can't compete with India and China in growth rates. We're growing, unfortunately, at 3%. They're growing closer to 10%. Um, we can't compete with um, them. We've dismantled our nuclear weapons. Um, China, India, Russia are all nuclear powers. So why did BRICS invite South Africa in? And the reason that they've invited South Africa into BRICS is because they needed a deposit on Africa. They needed a gateway into Africa. And they have seen in South Africa certain characteristics of that gateway. The banking system that's the second best in the world, um, one of the best run stock exchanges um, in the world, a internationally justiciable legal system, um, etc., etc., and the logistics and the infrastructure from which to do business with the rest of with the rest of um, of the continent, and that they understood that if you're going to go into the opportunities of sub-Saharan Africa, you've got to have a strong base in South Africa, and so Tata, as an example, is moving into the 300 strong. 300 million strong middle class in Africa, but it's assembling the cars in South Africa with its African headquarters there, and that's where it is approaching the African opportunity. And so we can um, we, we can go into quite a few of the opportunities which which are there. So the simple point I want to make is that that is who we are. That is why why South Africa becomes important in the scheme of, of things. I think um, what makes us confident is that if you look at the five countries in BRICS, between those five countries, 15% of the world's economy comes from. It's an over 10 trillion US dollar economy, those five countries, it's beginning very much to challenge for work across the world, it's beginning to challenge for the mineral wealth in the world, it's beginning to challenge for the scale on which projects can be, um, can be done. So that's 15% of the world economy. It's within BRICS, it holds 40% of the world's currency reserves, which gives it an enormous amount of power in the world, and it has 43% of the world's population. <coughs> That's where the human resources are coming from. That's where the markets are developing. If between five countries, you've got that amount of the world's uh, population. And so I think that when South Africa hosted in March, the BRICS summit, it, South Africa invited other African states and 15 African heads of state attended with all the NEPAD, the African Union instruments, um, all in place. And the decisions that were made were far-reaching. The formation of a BRICS development bank. Because the question that we were confronted with, how is it that when we want to be able to build the power stations that we need. If we want to build the dams that we need, or expand the rail infrastructure or the road infrastructure and get fiber optic connectivity going, we don't have the kind of capital to kickstart those projects. And so the idea of having enough equity um, to, 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 to decide our own future was an absolutely critical one. And so it is hoped that in the first two, three years, all BRICS countries would contribute to put into the pot within year one at 10 billion each. Those countries should put in the first 50 billion US dollars 
for a BRICS development bank and through that then begin to crowd in other sources of, of finance and to be able to use that as leverage because that will cover the full cost of what we are trying to achieve in Africa but that will be able to be a leverage when you speak to the World Bank, when you speak to the Exxon Bank, when you speak to the IMF, when you speak to OPIC, when you speak to um, private banks across the world, you've got to have enough leverage. And so the BRICS Development Bank gives us that leverage. And so the second major decision made by the BRICS Summit was to establish the BRICS Business Council. Now this is very interesting because it will connect the private sectors of the five countries so that there can be cooperative relationships. South Africa has, for example, spoken about the need to include at least the African diaspora. India then spoke about the need to include the Indian diaspora as part of the definition of how these business councils could be constituted. And so I think that when all of that, those, that work is done and the, and the nuts and bolts of a BRICS business council is put together, I think it just opens up opportunities um, across the world for us to be able to work together and to bid together for the variety of projects that will come across the BRICS world, but certainly kick-started in Africa and with all its opportunities then I think that we need to be able to understand how we implement the third outcome of that BRICS um, um, summit, and that is the think tank, the BRICS think tank, in which we get intellectuals together to harmonize policies, to get a regulatory framework together so that we don't have differential standards across um, the emerging markets um, of, the, of the world and the most important decision that was made is that BRICS is going to focus for the next 10 years its activities on infrastructure especially infrastructure in Africa because you know on any day you faced with a number of variables, like a pilot sitting um, in the cockpit, he's got all these buttons. But at the end of the day, you may not be able to control all the buttons, but there are a few that you've got to, 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 to understand which one is primary, which one is secondary, which one is tertiary. And I think that what we have been able to do is to understand infrastructure as primary, human resource development as the next priority, and and, 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 and so forth. Um, and so I think that those are absolutely critical decisions that would need to be, that would need to be taken. So the second major part of what I want to say is that the opportunities of Africa are available and they're largely available through South Africa because that's where you want to be able to locate yourself and to and to really move forward. When I speak to members of the African diaspora, I would say to them exactly what I'd say to members of an Indian diaspora. That being in the United States of America is not an accident. I think that all of you are located in a place where there is this economic recession. And as I said last night, our conservative estimate is that there is probably one trillion US dollars underinvested in the United States. It's money put under the mattress. It's too scared to get into the real economy because there's a fear of losing value. It's tolerated in the banks, but it's effectively, not productively, employed at one trillion US dollars. It's here, at best, 
the return on investment could be 2%. If they were to go elsewhere in the world, it would on average be 3%. In Africa, the rate of return on investment is 8%. And so, what our call is from Africa and South Africa is that Africa can probably comfortably handle year on year a flow of 5 to 10 percent of that one trillion that is manageable for our capacity. Because if we over flood it, we may begin to get into some negative consequences. So a 5 to 10 percent transfer of that <coughs> fellow U.S. capital, I think is what is manageable. The question is that your American counterparts, their minds are in siege. Not only is Congress in siege, they have internalized a siege mentality. They can't see the opportunities. They're all here waiting for better days. In fact, South Africa has had a 5% growth rate prior to 2008. After 2008, we went down to 2.5%, 3%. Not because something was wrong in our system, but it was because when Americans <coughs> and Europeans were in trouble back home, they sold off their liquid assets in South Africa to transfer funds to shore up difficult assets here. That's how we lost one billion jobs since 2008. The, the usual thing to do is that you keep on making money where the money is being made and then you transfer your profits. But because they haven't even sorted out here their tax system and they haven't found a regime for you to repatriate taxes without being punished. People sell up outside. So those are some of the, the key interests we have in tax debates in, in the US. But the point that I'm making is that when you have returns on investment of 8%, you need a courageous group of people to be the leading edge, to get that 5 to 10% of the 1 trillion over to Africa. And the people we've identified are largely members of a variety of diasporas. Because for you to be here, you have made some courageous moves in your life. You have been willing to risk all. And you have been able to come with very little and to become fairly successful. And so that's a kind of frontier spirit that I believe mainstream America is in danger of losing and the appeal therefore to diasporian communities is to be able to do a reverse frontier um, movement and to be the people whether your own companies whether you are actors within bigger companies we are finding Africans, Indians being the kind of people who say when they sit in boardrooms in Deloitte's or um, Ernst and Young, etc., etc., they are the people saying, we've got to get to Africa. And so the, 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 um, the really good news is that people are beginning to, um, to, 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 to look at that um, because where we are now, is um, that there is movement from a variety of US and European companies to say that they see themselves coming to Africa within the next decade. We can't wait for that decade to pass because windows open and windows close. And in Africa, if the windows are open and they get crowded with the Chinese, and the Brazilians and the Turks and so forth, America will find itself effectively out of the loop because the major infrastructure projects 
are already being put out for, for bidding as we are speaking um, now. I, we've spoken earlier that we've been able to fight very hard the two massive mega power plants in South Africa, Kusile and Madupe, largely coal-fired with some retrofitting for carbon capture, carbon storage, and carbon degradation, that's gone out. Um, and we have found in President Obama's National Export Initiative, we have found a wonderful way in which to, 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 to make a golden triangle work. And at its one edge on the base is the opportunity, and in this case, Kusile, a massive mega power plant in north of Johannesburg. On the other base of that triangle would be, for example, um, Black and & Veatch and uh, General Electric, which had spare capacity. Those two came together when the apex came together and Exxon Bank said, it will put the seven billion dollar facility in place to fund um, that power plant. And we then thought, let's see if this triangle can work. And this is where I'm saying that as members of the diaspora, you come in because um, one of the key advocates in Black and Beach for them to bid for the job was a member of the Indian diaspora, Shahid Kadri. We did much the same kind of thing when Transnet, our infrastructure logistics company in South Africa, when it needed a hundred locomotives to start redoing the rail infrastructure in South Africa. The Erie plant of General Electric, which produces locomotives, was going to close or go half, half time. We went to Exxon Bank. They put the one billion facility in place. The first 10 locomotives were delivered just like that. The other 90 are being put together in the plant that was established in South Africa. And now we have the possibility of doing the rolling stock for Africa's rail as we go forward. President Zuma of South Africa has been put in charge in the North-South Corridor meaning effectively the Cape to Cairo rail and road transport that will create, in a sense, the spine of the transport network in Africa. That's going to be going out on bids quite soon. Alongside that will be the ropes that will connect all the other African countries. That's massive amount of infrastructure that is waiting. Government funds had surrounded the African continent with fiber optic connectivity in the submarine cables down the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean. Africa is now connected to the east and to the west. The major project now is about connecting the two submarine cables across the land so that we are able to have the internet connectivity across the African continent. I've spoken about the water projects. I mean, Africans are thinking so big now that we believe that if we can harness the water of the Congo River, the Inga hydroelectric power station will be the biggest of its kind in the world and can, could probably sort out the daily needs of Africa. But we are beginning to think so big that we think that just the water capacity of the Congo River is so big that we could even refill Lake Chad and bring water to an area that has been dried out effectively through desertification. The South Africa, together with seven other African countries, have just won the rights to host the world's largest telescope, the Square Kilometer Array Telescope. Scientists say 
that in the first two weeks of data collection, humankind would have collected more data in that two weeks than they would have in the whole history of humanity. By being able to find a radio telescope that could pierce the heavens, find the origin of the stars, understand dark matter, harness the energy patterns in the universe, and really be able to, 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 to bring all of that knowledge and potential to bear for, for us here on Earth. Already NASA is queuing up to buy time on the Square Kilometer Array Telescope. Scientists all over the world are booking time. And they're booking it 20 years ahead in order to do that. It will drive the next generation of computers, of ICTs in the world today. And the question is, who is going to be the beneficiary? of that massive opportunity that is coming into Africa. And so I end up by saying that, especially in the terrain of infrastructure, there are no borders between the concrete infrastructure, the electronic infrastructure, and the soft infrastructure. And all of these are coming to market in the next few years. You are very strategically located to continue the work of that golden triangle where by virtue of being American companies you have access to the Exxon Bank, to OPIC and others in order to fund the kind of projects. I think the leverage that you require we are putting in place through something like the BRICS Development Bank. You are very fortunate in that you have a double dip you dip as Americans and you dip as members of the Indian diaspora. And that, I think, is the opportunity that we would want to really have you come. Those of you based in Stanford, Stanford, which is the kind of satellite where the world hedge fund managers have all decided that they can have it all. They can have access to that metropolis called New York, but they can also have a quality of life that is not dictated by the robustness and the pace of humanity in New York. I think that being located in a place like Stanford, you have the opportunity to transmit our confidence in the future of the African continent and by virtue of that, BRICS as a whole. I believe that the advantages that you bring to leverage your companies into Africa is absolutely critical. And as I said last night, whatever risks people imagine, if you read McKinsey's Lions on the Move, those risks are mitigated within the first year's worth of returns. There are still many issues that we have on the continent, but I believe that the way in which the continent is Extending democracy, deepening human rights, building the rule of law, and making sure that elections take place and conflicts are managed. I think that we should not allow the fact that Americans on any good day are geographically challenged. I want to give you one little illustration. We did an exercise um, with some American investors the other day in Minneapolis, and one of our Team South Africa people put up a map. So they showed the map of Africa. Then they took the map of the USA and put it into Africa, and the USA fitted into the Sahara Desert of Africa. Then they took the map of China and put it under the USA, and it fitted under our equatorial belt. Then they took Europe, and Europe fitted into Southern Africa. And so they took Argentina, and it fitted into West Africa. The point that I'm making is that 
Sometimes when you are too instinctive, when you believe you are too right, then you are wrong. If you think that because there's something happening in Nigeria that you must disinvest from South Africa, you have the picture completely wrong. I, I'm sure I don't have to I don't have to speak to people of Indian origin. We have much the same problem of geography, let alone a civilizational challenge. Because we represent ancient civilizations. In fact, the oldest human fossils ever found in the world were found in South Africa. A mother and child, 1,9 million years old. I don't even have to speak about how deep Indian civilization goes. And therefore, I think, going back to where we started, the kind of spirit of Mandela and the spirit of Gandhi, I think we are placed here for a broader role than simply making money. If it has to start with a geography lesson, fine. But at the end of the day, it's going to be about extending the civilizational heritage that I think we represent. So I'm hoping, having given most of you my business cards, that we would be able to see a movement towards the African continent, not simply because we want you to do us a favor, but because there's money to be made in Africa. Thanks very much.